this video is going to be about JTAG and uh, now you may think like JTAG boring I'm going to watch some cuts or dogs or I don't know what is now popular TikTok <laughs> no I'm just kidding uh, actually to create this video I had a call with David and uh, I was like super surprised how JTAG can be useful and uh, how much you can do with JTAG we had like three and a half hours long uh, call and uh, after the call I was like wow so I really hope you will find this video useful because this is like a cut down version of our three and a half hour long uh, call and um, I try to keep the, the keep in this video everything like super most interesting and uh, I really hope uh, this uh, video is going to help you to understand better what you can do with JTAG and I really hope it's going to be eye-opening for you to better understand uh, how JTAG works and uh, how it can help you I couldn't find uh, much information about uh, David on internet but basically he works uh, at X JTAG company and also I would like to say thank you very much to Simon also from XJTEC company uh, because uh, without uh, Simon's help this video would not exist also I would like to say that uh, when I was recording our call with David uh, his camera froze a couple of times so uh, sometimes his camera will not be moving but it's okay it's perfectly fine that's everything for introduction uh, we are ready to play my call with David and uh, David is going to start with talking a little bit about the chips where we can find the JTAG interface so here is my call with David so where do uh, we where do we find JTAG on what kind of chips usually? Um, so it's on lots of different devices. It's on all FPGAs. Uh, it's on uh, all CPLDs. It's on most processors of a reasonable size. Um, so if you've got a really really tiny um, processor, a microcontroller, you won't have it. So the uh, smaller PICs don't have it, but uh, lots of microcontrollers and all sort of major processors uh, have it, it uh, already. Um, lots of microcontrollers and processors will use JTAG as their debug and interface as well uh, to bring those up. Um, but yeah, it's it's very common across lots of devices. You can find some FIs that have um, boundary scan in them. You can find uh, there's some memory devices that have boundary scan in, in as well. Um, so yeah, it's across a wide range of things, but generally the the big device in the middle of your circuit board that makes your circuit board do something useful will generally have boundary scan. Okay. JTAG's built into um, most FPGAs, uh, CPLDs and processors, sorry, all FPGAs, CPLDs and most processors. Uh, uh, I just have to run through this. Um, and, and what it does is allows uh, through a test interface, uh, it, um, there's some extra silicon put into the device which effectively isolates the core logic from the pins and then that extra silicon allows you to take control of the pins directly without having to configure, enable or program the core logic of the device, which ah. then makes testing very simple because it as far as JTAG is concerned, it doesn't matter if your the core of your device is um, an FPGA, a processor, an Ethernet 5, a DDR memory. It, it, 
boundary scan, how to set the pin high and low from JTAG is always the same. So, so basically JTAG will some kind of switch off uh, everything what is on the chip and you through JTAG you directly control the pins. Exactly. So yeah, so JTAG itself is um, a four wire interface uh, which allows you to control what's referred to as a test access port tap controller, which is a relatively simple state machine. Inside the state machine, you can select different registers to communicate with. And uh, when you select um, a certain register called the excess register, it then effectively gives you control of the pins of the device. Um, and by setting bits in that register, the ones and zeros, you'll set the states of the pins or be able to read the states of the pins um, at the same time, okay? Um, so that's the concept of, of boundary scan is to make board level testing uh, independent of the devices that you've put down on the uh, on the circuit board. So theoretically, it really doesn't matter how complicated uh, chip you have because uh, you are not really talking to the chip when you are using this JTEC for testing. Absolutely. Theoretically, according to the specification, that's exactly what um, should happen. Okay. What do you have next? Here? Oh, okay. Okay. So being able to do, um, once you've taken control of the device, uh, so, so allows you to control the pins. And there's a standard type of or set of manufacturing defects you can then identify using boundary scan. So it's your, it's your open circuits, um, your short circuits, um, um, you're stuck high and you're stuck low, so you're, you're special, special, shine, special kind of short circuits. Uh, and then you can go on to do things like pull resistor testing. You can check that a net is defaults to a logic high or a logic low, and then you can drive against that and, and turn off the pin and, and make sure it goes back to the default start, uh, state in an appropriate time, those kinds of things. So that's normally step one of boundary scan testing is sort of controlling the pins on the JTAG device that you can control. Setting How do you high. check the resistive short? What's the difference <coughs> between like resistive short or direct short? That's a short? very good question. So um, the, um, the original classical way to do a, a, a connecti connectivity test on a JTAG device was to use um, contention. Um, where you would choose some pins on the device to be high, you choose some pins on the device to be low, um, and, and you'd drive those signals out. And if there was a short between two pins, you'd find uh, one of those pins, the drive on one of those pins would win. Normally the, the pin that's driving low would win. Okay. Um, and then when you read the state of the pin back, um, you've driven a pin high, but it's reporting low, and you know which pins you're driving low, and through sort of process of elimination, you could find the short. So the way you have to test for resistive shorts um, is to you choose some pins to be output pins and you drive them through a sequence of highs and lows and you choose some pins to be input pins and you sit there and whilst you're driving the other pin high and low, you sit there and monitor the input pins to see if they toggle at the same time as the uh, output pin. And again, through a process of elimination, if you see a pin toggle, uh, high, low, high, low, in the same time as you uh, are driving an output pin, you can uh, work through and eliminate to find out which two pins are shorted. Mm -hmm. okay. And how do you um, test uh, signals which are basically connected somewhere else, but not really to other pins of this same chip? Uh, so um, to do um, testing, so there's a couple of uh, different levels you can go in. So Firstly, um, you could test from a JTAG device to a non-JTAG device. Um, so the, the, the most simple case of this is you want to test an LED. By setting this pin high, the LED turns on and uh, use some way to tell that the LED is turned on. Now, in many cases, that will be a question to an operator, has the LED turned on? And they can say yes or no, but you can use an LED sensor, a camera, all those kinds of automated processes as well. Okay. So as a first step, um, you can do 
device level testing. So uh, then you can go move that on um, to replicate uh, digital interfaces. So here we've got an I squared C uh, EE prom. So using boundary scan, I can set the pins here uh, high and low at different times. To and emulate read those. the I squared C. Basically, you can bit bang the I squared C interface out of the boundary scan device. And you can take that from a simple I squared C interface right up to um, memory devices like every everything from your SRAM through your SSRAM to your DDRs all the way up to your DVR4. So DDR you have some bytes. kind of blocks or modules which. Uh... Yes, yeah, mm -hmm. to test to test these kind of common devices. You'll have uh, models, library models that allow you to. Uh, pull a file out of a library to go and test a, a DDR memory. Um, you'll have for I squared C devices because there's hundreds of thousands and millions of different I squared C devices out there. You'll have pro, uh, you'll have examples of all common devices, but you'll also have protocol files as well. So um, you can take an I squared C protocol file that's got a, a read write a read or a write function in it, and and very quickly take that and go okay. To test this particular real-time clock, I need to write to this register and then uh, to enable the, the clock to run and then read from this register to check that the, the second uh, register is incrementing over a period of time. Nice, okay. nice. So, I didn't know so, you can do this. Yeah, so that's that's the so this is the sort of second stage, and then you can go on from this where you have you we were talking earlier about having multiple JTAG devices. Um, and this is where, if you've got multiple de devices connected together, um, and here we've shown them being in one physical JTAG chain, so they're all together, uh, but quite often you'll have multiple uh, physical JTAG chains on a board. Um, you'll, you can test the interconnectivity between them um, by keeping the T clock and the TMS signals that go to the JTAG devices synchronized you can um, uh, send signals from one JTAG device to the other JTAG device and check for uh, your opens and shorts between and, and your stuck at faults even on the next game between the JTAG devices. That's actually the part of boundary scan testing that's very, very powerful and is extremely difficult to replicate in any other test procedure. Um, you for instance, because for JTAG, it doesn't matter what these devices are. Um, these devices could be, we could have a, a processor on the left-hand side here, an FPGA on the right-hand side. And to test the interconnectivity between those in boundary scan is, is very simple. I've set one pin on one, one device and I scan the register on the other device to see if the, the signal's got there. If you were trying to replicate in, that, in a functional test, you'd have to have a whole communications method between the two devices to, for the one device to know that it's set the pin and then have the other device read the pin and, and, and work through all those kinds of things. Oh, okay. I have two questions. Yeah. So the first one, what about differential pairs? Can you test differential pairs this way? Yeah, so... Um, absolutely. So, um, so the original specification, the 1149.1 specification, is about... Um, setting pins high, checking they've gone high, setting pins low, checking they've gone low. It's, it's a DC test, effectively. Okay? Um, and whether you check from the same device or a different device, it doesn't matter. Um, but uh, over the years, the specification has continued to evolve to keep up with technology or devices as we've um, added new technology to the to ICs. So in, all the way back in 2003, there was an update to the specification 1149.6, which um, coped with differential AC coupled pairs. Okay, um, and the the difference for 1149.6 is that instead of setting your pin high and, and checking for the level, uh, it sends edges and looks for the edges to to transition from a transmitter to a receiver. Okay, so it will send a st stream of uh, pulses effectively uh, between the transmitter and the receiver um, and the last edge of that stream of pulses will either be a, a rising or a falling edge and the receiver will report which type it saw. 
So can you then allows you to can you use this also like test performance, like uh, maximum speed uh, which you can achieve between this or in this connection? Like um, will the no. edges so, be disappear or? Yeah, so this test would have effectively be done. The, the edge rates on the pulses would effectively be um, um, uh, at the same because they'll be driven by the device so so they, they'd be the right edge rate but the time between the edges will be dependent on the t-clock frequency mm -hmm. going into the device so so no you're not going to test uh, full up performance uh, of those um, edges at all mm -hmm. sorry of those, of those pulses you can you can test for connectivity boundary scan is, is generally or that is aimed at testing for connectivity rather than performance. Yeah, I just I was just curious because yeah. you know it's interesting that you can basically send the uh, signals between two chips. And so the, my second question was about the speed, but you already answered this because the speed is uh, based on the clock of the JTEC. I, this. Yeah, so that's, that's effectively the limitation of boundary scan testing. What uh, is the maximum is, speed of this clock? Uh, there is no so each device has um, a max is a, has a specified maximum uh, which is defined by the IC vendor. Um, generally, um, that maximum has a lot of headroom on it, um, but there, there'll be a, a frequency which they guarantee that the device should work at. Um, what what is usually the frequency? So typically, they uh, most devices are somewhere between ten and thirty megahertz on the T clock interface. Um, so uh, then the size of the device will then determine the speed at which you can uh, toggle a pin on the device. Mm -hmm. um, so the, um, the the speed you can toggle a pin on the device is the, uh, the T clock frequency you can run the device at divided by the the register length of that. But obviously, twice the register length because you have to you have to scan the whole register once to set it high and the whole register again to scan it to, uh, to set it low. Um, so typically, uh, in most JTAG chains, uh, you can toggle pins in the low kilohertz frequency, mm -hmm. frequency um, even if you're running them at sort of ten thirty. Megahertz, you you tend to get a, a low kilohertz uh, toggle. Mm -hmm. Are they thinking like make it faster or something? Um, not through that process. Um, uh, the 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 way boundary scan is is designed to work as a as a daisy chain of um, devices through the board. We were just looking at there. Uh, so, so it would be maybe also then challenge uh, for a layout because it it may not work for much higher frequency than uh, tens so of megahertz. That's, a, that's a, a, another very good point, actually. Um, so, yeah, the because um, with JTAG devices you, you tend to end up with them daisy chains together. Um, you can end up with very long chains uh, of registers so um, typically for every digital IO pin you have on a device the, the register that controls that device is probably two to three times the number of digital IO pins on the device so if you've got a um, thousand pin BGA with sort of um, six or eight hundred um, IO pins you could easily have a boundary scan register that's over 2000 bits long and that's just one device mm -hmm. um, so even if you're clocking that chain at 20 megahertz um, the the speed which you can toggle the pins if you happen to you've got to get the data through all of your devices in your JTAG chain um, so you can end up with some very long registers very easily so there's no real aim to get it to go faster purely using the uh, sort of 1149 mm -hmm one specification. Mm -hmm. um, the second point you just raised there is actually uh, one of the key um, considerations for boundary scan testing. 
Um, it, so the toggling a pin on a JTAG device in itself um, is going to be in the low kilohertz region at best generally. But the JTAG interface to the device is actually a high speed interface. It will be running at 10, 30, so, so typically between 10 and 30 megahertz. And that's where you need to pay the attention when you're doing the layout is, is on the few signals that make up the JTAG interface and treating them with care and how you're routing them and making sure you're not putting stubs on, on T-clock and, and buffering it uh, appropriately when you're, you've got a, a large fan out um, and adding the correct termination in the correct place on the circuit board. My next question is, does it mean that if you would like to talk to your uh, devices faster, then it's better to have like two JTEC connectors? I'm not um, sure if your software, for example, supports uh, two JTEGs. Uh, yeah, so uh, our, our software will support uh, up to four independent JTEG chains uh, running up to um, 166 megahertz. So the, the question as to whether it's um, best to have two independent JTAG chains all comes down to signal integrity and also what your uh, what other devices you might be using um, what other reasons you might be using the JTAG interface for mm -hmm. so for instance earlier we were talking about a JTAG interface might be used for um, uh, debugging processes and uh, programming FPGAs and those kinds of things Generally, if you're using a, a, a tool that's targeted at programming an FPGA, um, the, it's going to want just that FPGA in the JTAG chain to be able to optimize or be able to work correctly. Or, or, or at best, it'll only want devices from that vendor in the JTAG chain so it knows what to do with them. So um, can you somehow uh, like disable other devices in the chain so you don't waste the clocks on them? Um, it only so there is a, a mode um, inside a JTAG device uh, called clamp. Um, so actually, let's talk about that for a second. So inside uh, a boundary scan device, um, there are a few different modes. Uh, there's, a, there's a few that have to be there. Um, so X test is the external test mode, that's boundary scan, that's where we can control the pins. Mm -hmm. There is a bypass mode, mm -hmm. um, which uh, is enables a single bit register between the TDI and the TDO pin, okay, um, and so allows data to go through the device in just using one extra T clock. Mm -hmm. um, but the bypass register, also, the bypass mode, also allows the device to boot and run operationally. So it effectively doesn't interfere with the device at all. It just, if you've got your devices daisy chained together, it just allows you to pass data through them without interacting. Without. Uh, and how do you set this mode if there is like only one bit? Um, so all of the. Um, registers are selected through a, a, a different instruction uh, uh, through a different register so if we go back a, 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 a step here the the four JTAG signals that we've got on a on a on a JTAG device um, they go into the tap controller and the tap controller is a state machine and so the state machine has um, two routes through one is the DR path, the data register path, and one is the IR path, the instruction register path. So the state of the TMS pin on a JTAG device um, on the rising edge of T clock will will move you through the state machine. Okay. Um, when you get the state machine to a shift state, um, this is where the state of the TDI pin is sampled on the rising edge of T clock and the state of the TDO pin is updated on the falling edge of T clock. So to, if we want to select a register or a mode that we want to put the device into, what we do is uh, get the state machine to transition to shift IR and then we scan in 
uh, an instruction value which selects the mode that we want. Okay, so basically always when you connect the JTAG and when you start uh, kind of talking to these devices, you always need to like kind of set them up before you exactly. actually do what you want to do. Exactly, yep. Yeah. So there's a, 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 a sequence that you'd go through, um, a reset sequence to get the state machine of each JTAG device back to a known state, which is this test logic reset state. And then you would scan in first an instruction to the device to uh, put the device into a particular mode. And then once you've got that instruction in, um, you, you hit this update state, and that's when the device changes to that mode. And then you can come around to the DR path here, and then you can shift data in and out of that register that you've selected to um, uh, to make the device do something. Now, if you select the bypass register, you'd be just shifting in one bit through the device in this mode because you'd be wanting to talk to some other device in the JTAG chain. Mm -hmm. Can we go to the previous picture which was showing uh, what is inside? Uh, this one here? Yes. So what okay. are the other things here? So. So that's, uh, so we had access and bypass, um, sample preload. Because of the way the state machine works, where you have to select the register you want to communicate with before you can communicate with it, um, the, if you just select the X test register, you don't know what the values of the DR, the data register, the X test register are because you haven't loaded them. So the preload uh, mode here allows you to effectively uh, initialize the X test register before you select the X test register. Mm -hmm. uh, as an added benefit of being able to do that, so effectively the preload part is us scanning in data to set the initial values of the X test register as a, a bonus on that. At the same time, when you're scanning in data, you're also you've got your TDO scanning out data. So you also get to read the value of the pins as they are with the device being active as well. And that's what this sample state is. So you could you can effectively scan data through the pins of the device whilst the device is active and see what the pins are doing on the device. You, you can't capture um, uh, every bus transaction because you again, you've only yeah, got a kilohertz yeah. sample but what you can do is see which pins on the device are active. So if you know that your device should be, say, active, accessing a, a spy nor flash, uh, you could scan through the, the sample register and see if you see the pins toggling. Mm -hmm. You won't know what, it, what data is coming back and forwards, but you'd be able to see the, the, uh, uh, the, the four pins of your spy into place mm -hmm. uh, transitioning um, and, and know that there's activity on those pins. Okay. okay, so from so, this so picture, I understand, or if I understand right, basically there are other things how JTAG can be used. For example, because you already mentioned it can be used for also for debugging. Yep. So, and then it's nothing uh, with this testing and anything, it is accessing directly to the silicon then, correct? Um, so the, yeah, so the IEEE parts are independent of the sort of operation of the silicon uh, in, in, in theory for the original 1149.1 specification. Um, you don't have to know what the silicon's doing. The application specific modes where you're programming or debugging a device, that's when you start accessing internal registers inside the core of the mm -hmm. device. And that's start to get to silicon. Wow, this is something like completely new for me. I had no idea. I, I thought so, JTEC is just JTEC and it looks yeah. like it's some kind of universal interface. It, it's a, it is very widely used as an interface. The, the catch in, in that is that um, whilst anything that's defined in the specification, in the uh, IEEE specification is open and public knowledge, there's no requirement for a device manufacturer to release the information about um, what else they use the JTAG interface for. Mm -hmm. Many device manufacturers do. Certainly, 
um, almost all devices with ARM cores inside. Um, you can get access to the sort of debugging and programming information if you've got the, the right sort of relationship with the device manufacturer, um, such that you can get in and program the devices or use internal um, components in the in the device. So lots of, lots of microcontrollers these days have sort of built in ADCs and those kinds of things. And as part of your board level test, you can get in and actually use those ADCs to sort of test power rails and those kinds of things or whatever you've used the ADC for in the circuit um, as part of the board level test. And then you can go on to program the internal flash memory or even use the processor or the FPGA to speed up external programming, um, which is a, another sort of big part of JTAG board testing is, is programming. Once you've got the board tested, now let's program it as quickly as we can as well. If you need, for example, debug BIOS, let's say on processor, then you can get like a specific um, tool which will go through code inside of the BIOS and you can debug this through JTAG. Uh, yes, you, yes, you, yes, you absolutely can. Yeah, but through, you yeah. need then also specific hardware, specific JTAG hardware, which will support, which is supported by this special software. Exactly, yeah. And, and that, going back to the earlier point, is typically where you need to start breaking your JTAG devices out onto separate chains, because those debuggers want to talk to the device that they're designed to talk to and not have too much of other manufacturers' devices mm -hmm. in JTAG chain. So that's kind of the se one of the separating points of board level test. We actually want all of the JTAG devices on the circuit board in the JTAG chain, and that's why we support multiple JTAG taps and we can support sort of um, lots and lots of devices in the chain because we want maximum JTAG devices for maximum coverage, whereas the, the debuggers want just the device that they uh, want to interact with in the chain uh, so that they can interact quickly and they don't have to worry about sort of adding extra instructions and uh, extra control for other devices in the JTAG chain. So that's where you end up with your JTAG chain split across multiple headers um, to enable your, your testing. Mm -hmm. Sorry, to enable your JTAG to, to work in the different stages of your board. I understand. Uh, yeah. life cycle. So what are these uh, optional modes for? So, uh, so the optional modes um, are included by the uh, as part of the, the JTAG specification. So the ID code mode is in all modern devices. This is a 32-bit number that can be read out of the device, which will identify the device against the documentation that describes how the device works. So the documentation for the device, it's called a, a BSDL file, will have the same value in it um, so that you can match one to the other. Okay, so that's the ID code. Uh, it was it's classed as an optional mode because in the original specifications for the original sort of nineteen ninety spec, it was an optional. But all modern devices do support it. Mm -hmm. um, Clamp is uh, uh, is a mode that allows you to um, set the state of the pins on the device and then enable the bypass register. Mm -hmm. So this one is really useful in board level test um, when you are trying to optimize your testing. So um, you wouldn't want to switch, typically you don't want to switch a device into bypass in the middle of your board level test because the device will go active, it'll boot, it'll start interacting with the circuit board and eventually that will cause a problem somewhere, an intermittent problem in your testing. Okay. Um, but at the same time, you do want to shorten your JTAG chain as much as possible to make it make testing efficient. So clamp is that middle ground. You do a scan to set your uh, your default pins of your X test um, register, and then you enable clamp, and then that puts the bypass register between TDI and TDO. Um, so makes your chain as short as possible, but keeps you in boundary scan mode. Mm -hmm. Nice. Uh... What are embedded instruments? 
So uh, some devices, uh, we were talking about uh, ADCs, but some devices have um, temperature monitors, voltage monitors ah, inside the device. Okay. Um, and um, the first device that did this was uh, the Xilinx uh, that I know of did was the Xilinx Vertex 5, but they effectively made those accessible from the JTAG mm -hmm. interface. Um, so you could go in and check all the power rails and the, the, the chip thought it was happy, it wasn't too hot and all those kinds of things as part of the uh, interface, uh, sort of through the JTAG interface. Okay, we can move uh, next. So what is yeah. the like hardware specification of the bus? So I've seen there are some pull-ups. So what are the requirements? So... Um, uh, it's always like... Most... Uh, 3.3 volt bars or no 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 so there's there's no um, physical uh, requirements on the bus so there are recommendations of what you should do on the bus to make the bus operational as we were talking about earlier it's 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 a high speed interface and you should treat it as such um, and adding appropriate termination and appropriate pull ups will um, make the the, the the interface better, okay? And th there's two stages when you're looking at the JTEC interface. For most of a circuit board life, the JTEC interface is gonna be non-operational. So one of your first things you want to do is add the appropriate sort of pull-up resistors, pull-down resistors to make sure that you do end up with a, a JTEC interface that is that stays in a static state uh, when you're not using it. Uh, the worst thing you want is for your device to transition into test mode um, uh, at some arbitrary point because it's had some noise on the JTEG interface. Because once it's in test mode, it will stop doing whatever it is that it's supposed to be doing. Um, so, so yeah, we've got some, uh, there are some recommended uh, pull resistors on the JTEG interface. Um, the for devices that support TRST, uh, we recommend a pull down on the TRST pin. Uh, so for any device that supports a, a TRST pin, um, which is the test reset pin. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not like a real reset. It's not going to reset the whole no, chip. Just, it, it only resets it, the registers of the JTAG. It just, reset, it just resets that um, JTAG state machine and holds mm -hmm. that in reset. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. So. We recommend a pull down on that so to make sure that that interface can never go active. Okay, um, there are some caveats on that recommendation. There are, there will be an internal, should be an internal pull up resistor on that test reset pin inside the device according to the JTAG specification. So you will be causing a potential divider, and if you're designing a sort of a current sensitive board, that's something that's going to be battery operated and has to last a long time, you might not want to have an external pull down on that interface because mm -hmm. you'll end up with a current drain. Mm -hmm. um, uh, also, uh, going back to other tools that are going to use the JTEC interface, there are some debuggers uh, uh, that don't drive the TRST pin and do rely on it being pulled up mm -hmm. on the circuit board to be able to access the device. Um, so that can be another reason not to pull down the TRST pin, but uh, in the general case, you can pull it down and that's fine. Mm -hmm. okay. so what about one. the VCC? Um, VCC can be anything for it. It's going to depend on what the the I/O interface for the, the device is. So, um, the lowest uh, VCC interface on the JTAG that I know of is just just under one volt. Um, um, and then yeah, and then you've got your typical. Most devices are either one point eight, two point five, or three point three. Your typical. So, if you would like to connect all these different devices, you need to use buffers between them. If they're running at different JTAG, if they're running at different voltages, again, that's another situation where people, uh, depending on what your circuit is, do I want to add the expense of adding a buffer, or do I just bring the JTAG out to a separate header so that when I'm testing, mm -hmm. I just connect up multiple headers? It's your, your other consideration of why I'm going to split my JTAG chains. Okay. Um, the other part of uh, terminating the JTAG chain is the blue um, device, uh, blue components here, and that's for terminating the JTAG chain to make sure it, it works when you're actually trying to use it. So th this is our high-speed termination, some clock termination on the T clock at the end of the uh, at the end of the net, 
some um, source termination on our TDO uh, next to next to the JTAG device at the end of the JTAG chain, um, and some sort of deglitching circuitry on any asynchronous resets that are coming down um, the cable onto the circuit board. Okay. Um, so the next slide uh, talks about uh, the cable going between your circuit board and the JTAG controller you're using to do your, your board level test. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, just like there's no VCC defined for your um, uh, JTAG interface, it can be whatever the chip works at, there's no connector defined that you have to put down on a circuit board either. It's completely up to whatever you want to use. So, uh, if you're doing volume production, you might use test point stacks as your JTAG chain. Um, if you're debugging your circuit board during prototype design, if you're using a debugger, um, the debugger will probably come with a fixed pinout of you must use a 10 pin, 14 pin, 20 pin header of this pitch to be able to connect directly to our debugger. Again, that will vary from manufacturer to manufacturer as to what that header is. So this talks a bit about uh, boundary scan. We, we had a quick look at the JTAG interface, it's a, the JTAG interface being our four wire interface um, going into the device that controls that tap controller. So that tap controller allows us to select that excess register. And then that's when we start talking to boundary scan cells that control the pins on the device, okay? Um, and this is a very simplified uh, uh, diagram of a, of a device. Um, and it's to illustrate what a boundary scan cell can do. So in most of a, the life of a boundary scan cell, it behaves transparently where it's got parallel in, parallel out, whatever the core wants to do, comes straight through the boundary scan cell and goes straight to the pin and the boundary scan cell doesn't interfere with that. Um, and then when we're configuring the boundary scan cells, we can shift data through uh, the boundary scan cells. And again, that doesn't interfere with the parallel in parallel out stage. Um, and so then you need to know exactly how these pins are connected in chain? Exactly, exactly that, yep. So, um, and the, the last point here is um, when we want to read the value of a pin, that's what's officially determined as a, a capture. And when we want to write the state of a pin, that's officially determined as an update. Mm -hmm. okay. But yes, going to your point, you need to know what boundary scan cells are associated with what pins to be able to control the JTAG device. But there's a step more complication to that. Different pins with different capabilities will have um, different number of boundary scan cells associated with them. So. A typical GPIO pin on an FPGA, for instance, will have three boundary scan cells. Wow. Okay. okay. So, and this is where we, well, I was talking earlier, you, your boundary scan register, if you've got 800 digital IO pins on your on your FPGA, you've got a big FPGA. You can have, you actually can easily have three times more. Yeah, yeah, exactly that. So, um, yeah, so, your band, so you, you'll have an input cell on your on your GPIO pin, that's the bottom one here. You'll have an output cell which has the capability to drive the pin, and then you can also you'll also have a control cell uh, which enables uh, the pin to be uh, turned on or turned off. Mm -hmm. So, also it allows the output to be turned on or turned off. So, this this cell at the top here says whether it's outputting or not, and this says whether it's outputting high or low. And then your input cell at the bottom allows you to sample that pin, and this is the sort of another clever part of, of boundary scan testing, the input cell is connected on the sort of pin side of the output driver, so you can self-test the pin. So I can set this output to drive high, and then I can independently effectively check that mm -hmm. it has gone high I using understand. the other boundary scan cell. And that's what allows you to check for your stuck high and your stuck low faults. I have okay. a question. Yep. Where do you get all this information? Because I have never seen description of this in data sheet. Uh, exactly, yep, it's not in the data sheet, it is in the BSDL file. So ah. earlier on we were talking about there being an ID code inside a 32-bit number inside the, the JTAG device which relates back to the documentation for the device. So 
that documentation is a BSDL file, which is a sort of boundary scan description language file. Effectively, it was originally based on VHDL. It's deviated from that these days, but it's uh, uh, generally based on that. And it describes um, what the how the JTAG device works, what modes it supports. What so we were talking about there being some optional modes, um, clamp and ID codes. So it describes whether it supports those. It can describe what the other sort of application specific modes that it might support will be defined. The registers, the addresses for those. It will tell you uh, the pinout for the device and the package for the device. And also the find and ultimately define the boundary scan register for that device, which cells control which uh, ports on the device. So this is the file which basically, if someone would like to write this test software, they need this file. You load yep. it, and then you basically yep. see your chip or, or see yep. the pins uh, and everything. Yeah, absolutely. I apologize for interrupting our call with David, but. Uh, we just need to move a uh, little bit further. Uh, basically, we know everything, the essential to understand how JTAG works. And now we would like to be more practical. We would like to see some examples. So David is going to uh, show us in this video how a JTAG test can look and how it can be created. So let's continue. Here is uh, David talking about how JTAG can be used for testing. So what I'll look at first is running the test on a circuit board uh, to look at the types of tests we're performing. Um, so this is our, our runtime tool. Uh, this here is intended for use in a production environment where you're testing lots and lots of boards um, and you want to run the boards, get some pass fail results, uh, get debug information for those boards, all those kinds of uh, things so you can fix the things that are broken, uh, but effectively get boards through and potentially, uh, and you pro this is going to program as well as it runs through. So um, I'm just gonna open up a, a project that's already created here, um, which, is for our demonstration hardware. Move this aside for a second and open up this. So, this here is a uh, live view of the board that we're testing. Mm -hmm. uh, so, this is the, the board we're connected to. It has um, two JTAG devices on it. Uh, one is a, a configurable uh, device, a little CPLD, uh, and the other is an ARM based um, uh, little microcontroller. And then we've got some RAM, we've got some spy flash, we've got some logic devices, we've got clocks, we've got I2C ADCs, we've got um, RS-485 LEDs, push buttons, those kinds of things. So lots of the standard kind of digital components you'll find on lots of different circuit boards, okay? Um, and here in the, in the runtime environment, uh, what we're going to do is just run through the tests. I'm just going to also open up Uh, this other application. So using this connector at the end of um, the uh, demonstration board here, I can inject faults into the um, circuit board. So um, what I've got effectively here in my uh, test system is a list of tests that are gonna run down the, uh, gonna run through on the right hand side here. And, and they're aimed at uh, getting maximum test coverage from my circuit board here. So basically, then, you open some kind of project, yep, which includes a number of tests. Yeah, yeah exactly that. Um, and we'll have a look at the environment where we can create those tests later and the raw files that we use as part of developing, uh, that we take in to do that. So one of the files will be the BSDL files for the JTAG devices, but we'll, we'll look at that later. Okay. So. So yeah, if I run run the tests here, um, actually within the system here, um, the first few tests that are running at this point, uh, actually we haven't actually done any JTAG tests. So um, within our JTAG controller, apart from doing 
uh, the JTAG interface, we can also do any other uh, sort of digital interface, I squared C and SPY. So the system here is actually um, uh, communicating, uh, uh, taking voltage measurements from the circuit board and communicating with the I squared C ADC on the circuit board to mm -hmm. enable us to pick all the power rails for the board have come up and the board is correctly powered before we go into the boundary scan test. Um, one key point of boundary scan testing is the board has to be powered. Uh, so so other tests. Uh, other uh, tests maybe, maybe I didn't hear how do you communicate with the ADC? So the ADC is I squared um, C bus. I is guess. I squared C. Ah, yeah. Okay. So our JTAG controller has the capability to do I squared C transactions okay. as well as JTAG. Um, so it can communicate. Uh, so on that 20 way header we have here, apart from having the JTAG signals, this board has been designed to bring up the I squared C interface for the ADC to, to the header so that we can check that the power rails are so up. So you have running. some extra uh, pins on the header, uh, not like a JTAG uh, interface, but plus some extra pins which you can exactly. control and for example, emulate yep. I square C bus. Exactly that. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so we got actually one pin we're using to do a voltage measurement directly on the main power supply, and then two more pins that we're using to do I squared C. And later on, we'll see some other pins that are used uh, to do other measurements as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the, the systems come up here uh, asking for a, a serial number. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I'll, I'll just give it a, a serial number to the board and, and then this serial number, will, will, the way this test is set up, will get recorded in the log file so you've mm -hmm. got traceability but also at the end it gets programmed into the board. Okay, So we'll run that through. So uh, Now the test, it goes through all the tests which you have in the right panel, correct? Exactly that. So it's running down this, it's, it's paused at this test here uh, because this test is asking for some user input. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll move that on in a second, but just, uh, um, so we, we see here, um, that we've reset the serial number to Robert. Um, then we do a check to validate that the JTAG chain, the interface is working. So can, can the circuit board's got two JTAG devices on it. Can I communicate with those devices? Can I read out the ID codes from those devices? Um, as long as we can, uh, we can then move on to the uh, other tests on the circuit board. So this one here is the really powerful part of JTAG where we are now in an automatically generated test that is um, toggling all the pins that we can control on the two JTAG devices, setting them high and low at different times to each other to enable us to detect all of those open shorts, stuck at mm -hmm. checking the pull resistors. It will go on and check uh, logic connections. So if you have a JTAG device, um, some uh, inverters, and then going into another JTAG device, it will check those kinds of simple uh, logic-based connections. And it would go on to do 1149.6 testing as well if the board had 1149.6 enabled devices on it as well. So it does the full sort of range of uh, connection testing, OK? So it does all of that as you automatically generated tests. So that's that first stage of testing we were talking about, checking the JTAG devices. Um, after that, we go into testing the non-JTAG devices. Mm -hmm. So um, you see here we've got an SRAM, SPY flash, I squared C E from different types of memory. But to test them, the, the concept is the same. We need to get some data in and out of that that memory device to be able to prove that the, the memory device is, is working and that all the pins on the interface are working. Okay, So for an SRAM, that will involve uh, writing to a few different locations within inside the device with different data patterns so that we can prove that all of the pins on the interface are correctly operational, mm -hmm. uh, are correctly connected. Okay, If one of the pins was in a failure state of an open or a short, some of the data that we write to the device would go into the wrong location and we detect that and therefore be able to identify. Um, no, you mentioned uh, uh, you can also, or you have these modules also for like uh, DD uh, RAM, I don't know, DRAM yeah, 3 yeah. or? Uh, all the way up to DDR4. Really? DDR4. Okay, yes, wow. Yeah. So, so those devices, um, and we'll, look at, we'll actually look at DDR4 
uh, file later. Those devices, uh, you're testing in boundary scan, uh, you, you test them well outside of their um, specified operating speeds because we're obviously yeah, toggling yeah, the collateral frequency. You just uh, would like to check if there is no so short circuit or if exactly. they are soldered so, correctly. But, but uh, with, a with, a, uh, with those memories, you can still write data into the memory and reliably read it back. In Even in this small, slow speed? Even at the sort of small, slow speeds. So yes, that's testing. Uh, so testing a, a RAM will um, uh, involve writing various different addresses with various different data patterns. A spy flash, um, they have built-in registers with predefined data in them. So, and because it's a serial interface, by successfully reading that data out, you actually don't necessarily have to write to the device to be able to test the device. You can, if you can read out the data you're expecting, generally that's enough to test the device. Okay, so that's what we do in this case. And again, with an I squared CE prom, it's a serial interface. So if we can read some known data out of the device, um, we can prove that interface. Or with an EEPROM, we can write one byte into it, read that back, uh, and then uh, then clear it again afterwards to prove that the device is working. OK. Um, after those memory tests, we go on to um, an oscillator test. So I'll just um, bring up the schematic here for the a circuit board. This oscillator, what we've got on the circuit board here, um, got an oscillator, goes through a clock buffer, and it goes to multiple different locations on the circuit board. So this test is actually run uh, to test that the clock goes to all of the different locations. Okay, so it's tested once for the um, going to the C the MCU once to go to the CPLD and, and once to go off to the actual XJ link that it goes to, again the clock on this board happens to go to a header that the uh, JTAG controller has access to so we can test that it's getting there okay did you just open like uh, our tube schematic or uh, it, it was uh, it did open uh, the schematic for the circuit board uh, and the schematic for this circuit board is captured in Altium so yeah as part of the production tools and this is more useful uh, it can be used uh, greatly when you're trying to debug a problem. You can open up the, the schematic for the board to understand the bit of circuitry that potentially fails. That's generally when you want to look at it. Uh, so you can help sort of, uh, help you debug and isolate the fault and re resolve the, the issue with the circuit board. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, uh, so that's that. Um, the, the testing of an oscillator, uh, boundary scan, Again, we've got our, our sample rate of probably low kilohertz. So we're not testing frequency of the oscillator. We're testing for the, the, the pin on the JTAG device is transitioning. Sometimes when we read it, it's high. Sometimes when we read it, it's low. Mm -hmm. As long as we see enough highs and lows in a short enough period of time, we can be confident something's out there is causing that pin to oscillate. Mm -hmm. Okay. This final test here um, is using the capabilities of the, the XJ link again to actually measure the frequency so originally the very first test we did measured the voltage using a, a spare pin on the controller this one here is now measuring the frequency of that clock using another spare pin on that controller mm -hmm. so it's happy to report that uh, we're, we're measuring our clock as being uh, just off the eight megahertz that we're expecting which is within our error range for our, our so this is one. also extra pin on your jtec header yeah yeah, absolutely. So we've got two JTAG interfaces. Um, and we've got uh, the power monitor. We've got the uh, I squared C interface, and and we're also using a pin for this clock test as well. Mm -hmm. um, after the, the oscillator test, we go into some um, different I squared C tests. So we've got an, an accelerometer on the board. So it runs. It first checks the I squared C interface to the device, responds as expected. It reads out the manufacturer data from the device to check that reads back as, ex as expected so we've fitted the right device. And then accelerometers have a self-test in it built in. Um, so we trigger the self-test and check the results. Um, so we know that the not only is the digital interface the accelerometer working, but the, the accelerometer itself is passing its, it, its own self in built-in self-test. Mm -hmm. All as part of the boundary scan test. Um, then we're going on to um, test testing the, um, the, the, doing further tests on the ADC. Um, so um, this test here, there's a variable resistor on the circuit board. 
<coughs> um, so if I were to rotate this, we'd be able to see that the voltage uh, changes here mm -hmm. and we can put that back as part of the test. Uh, but if we just carry on, um, the test then goes into uh, doing some various... Um, so you uh, can uh, somehow jump through the test? Uh, so uh, to get the test to carry on, I had to press spacebar okay. um, to, to move that test forward. So I was to say that I was happy with that voltage that was being read. Mm -hmm. okay, okay, I understand. Uh, so uh, we went, then went through some RS-485 testing. RS-485 devices have uh, a capability you can test them. Uh, the, the transmit is looped internally to the receive. So mm -hmm. you can test that as a local loopback. Um, the connector we've got at the top of the, uh, the board here also allows an external, uh, effectively does an external loop back between the two RS-485 transceivers. So we can test not only the digital side of the transceivers, but also the RS-485 side of the transceivers. And again, you can do the same concept with sort of CAN and LIN buses as well. Okay. And uh, how do you connect the, or where do you connect the digital interface of the RS-485? So that just comes back to one of the JTAG devices. Okay, one of the uh, mm, chips on the board. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. So yeah, on our circuit board here, uh, we've got our two RS-485 transceivers, and these signals simply come back to one of the, the JTAG devices. Mm -hmm. um, I understand. To allow us to test them. So you control the pins on the microcontroller or something, and that's exactly. And these pins, yeah. they are connected to the RS-485. Uh, um, 485 uh, exactly. transceiver, and then uh, yep. this one is in the loop mode, so you yep. need to read exactly what you are that. sending there. Okay. Yeah, exactly that. Okay. And then we, we've moved on now to uh, an LED test. So the LEDs on this board are all arranged in a nice, pretty circle. So we actually test all of the LEDs as one single test. Um, if, the, if the LEDs were dotted around, you'd probably want to test them individually. But as we've got a nice arrangement, we can uh, test them all in one go. We're happy they're all working. Mm -hmm. If we click yes, it it skips uh, testing them individually. But if we click no, it would then step through and test each one individually, mm -hmm. so we could identify exactly what which one was wrong. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, and then we've got the push button test here. So we've got this little push button down the bottom here. So I'm just going to use my uh, uh, fault controller at the top here. I'm just going to set the set the button and then uh, mm -hmm. change the button, and that's simply toggled the the state of the pin on that device. So the, um, uh, you can't press the button because this board is somewhere in your office? Uh, yeah, so yeah. So this it's not on your table the, right now? No, no, it's not okay. It's not on my no, it's a table right now. So this is a remote PC that I've got uh, set up with the camera on it. So, yep, that's okay. uh, in the office. So after we did those uh, LED tests, uh, we went into some, um, some further tests um, uh, 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 using uh, the um, so these aren't actually boundary scan tests. These are actually the MCU in the on the board has a DAC inside it. It mm -hmm. has ADCs inside it. So we're actually accessing the MCU, the core of the MCU, to then access the internal registers to then make use of the those internal devices as part of the boundary scan test or the board level test. Um, to again to further extend the test coverage on the circuit board. Okay. Wow. Um, okay. Um, so that then allows us to yeah to do to maximise the coverage for the circuit board. And for this, uh, you need uh, something, uh, some special code, or uh, the BSDL file is just enough. So no, th that uh, no, that's where you start to need the reference manual. So th that's you. Th those tests are using the application specific registers mm -hmm. inside the uh, inside the devices mm -hmm. uh, and to control those is a case of reading the reference manual for the device mm -hmm. uh, to, to understand how to access those and co to control them mm -hmm. okay I understand. Uh, um, so and then uh, after that we went into a programming sequence uh, and the programming sequence at the end here runs uh, because the tests have passed if the if the board if any of the tests previous to this had failed, it would um, uh, not run the programming because there's no point spending time mm -hmm. programming a faulty board because you're going to have to run it through test again anyway. 
So uh, we program up the CPLD, uh, and we then also program up the spy flash on the board, and then program up the processor as well. Okay. So programming up the spy flash here, this is actually again done using the processor. Uh, so by communicating with the processor, you can get the processor to program the spy flash at much higher speeds than you could potentially do uh, using uh, just pure boundary scan. So using boundary scan, we've got that pin toggle rate of a killer, uh, sort of in the low kilohertz. So doing a spy transaction is going to be a, a, div a division of eight on whatever that is again. So you can quite easily get down to the situation where you're doing, you're taking that you can do a kilobyte per second to transfer data into a spy flash if you're programming by a boundary scan. So it's that same situation as reading the ADC, so you are basically accessing directly the registers of the SPI controller in the exactly. processor or microcontroller? Yeah, yeah. Okay. so exactly that. And it, by doing that, you can then offload the, um, the, the activity of setting the pins back to the microcontroller and therefore it can do them at much higher speeds and get your programming programming and, speed and down. what is happening with the microcontroller when you are using this uh, block inside of the microcontroller is well so, yeah so as part of coding that you you set up your microcontroller so that all the pins on the microcontroller were in the in the correct states to uh, not interfere with your testing but yeah so you take your microcontroller out of boundary scan mode put it into generally into debug uh, so and then you'd set up all the pins to the correct state, uh, and then you sort of uh, use the microcontroller to access the spy flash. So the microcontroller is running. Yes. Yeah. You. Uh, it, it is just not kind of using the SPI model because you are using it, or JTAG is using oh, well, it. So so yeah. So when you're doing this kind of testing, you you take full control of it. So you load your own image, load a programming image into as part of the operation of controlling the spy, the, the microcontroller would be running just a programming image that you download as part of the test. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not, um, it's not like you've got a clash between what the microcontroller is supposed to be doing and what you want to do, take control of the microcontroller, um, don't let it load its code, put some specific uh, programming code into the microcontroller and then you feed that programming code the data that goes into the, the spy mm -hmm. flash um, and it sits there and it programs away so you link. are not basically you are not controlling directly the uh, spi uh, block inside of the microcontroller but you first flash some kind of firmware which can uh, use this block and then you feed the data which you would like to flash into the memory. Uh, yes, uh, let me I've got a picture somewhere, two seconds. So what, what we're effectively doing is uh, through the debug interface, um, we download some code into the processor core uh, that will control the, the flash interface um, and have some buffers in it as well. Mm -hmm. And then the, the code is effectively a programming in, engine that understands the flash that mm -hmm. it's connected to. Um, and then through the, once we've got that up and running, we set that off, we then uh, load uh, the code that's going to go into the flash, into the buffers. As soon as the programming engine sees a buffer with some data in it, it starts transferring it into the flash. And then we move on to filling up the next buffer uh, and then when the programming engine's finished the first buffer, it moves on to the next one, and, and we, put, we we go around in a loop like that to, to do it. And, and this program you're... engine, it's like uh, you write it in standard uh, environment for the specific microcontroller, for example. It's like standard uh, hex file, or it's uh, specific something what... You... Yeah, no, it would be a, a standard uh, compilation mm -hmm. of, uh, okay. of code. And it just knows where to take the data from. Yeah, so as part of writing, so as part of writing that code, yeah, if you'd set up some uh, buffers in the in the RAM. Uh, generally, you try to use the internal memory, but yeah, set up some buffers in the RAM, uh, and uh, then fill those buffers up and, and set, set up a, set up the engine so it automatically, as soon as it sees data, it goes, it goes okay. I'll stick that into the mm -hmm. into the flash for you. Okay, yeah, so that's the idea. When you're when you're looking at ADCs, um, generally rather than 
uh, having to download code, you can use the debug interface to access the registers that control the mm -hmm. ADC directly, read and write those directly, um, unless you need to take high speed ADC measurements. So if you were trying to capture a waveform, you might again put down an engine mm -hmm. that's going to sit there and read the ADC at very high speeds and again store the results into some internal memory and then you go read those out. I'm thinking this uh, JTAG, it can be like super useful if you have some faulty boards, like for diagnostic, it can be like, yep. it can save so much time. Yep, uh, absolutely. So it, it's so. not like, not even like for, uh, for testing the boards, for, but for this diagnostic, I think it can be like, wow. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And, and that's where, uh, uh, as I said at the beginning, um, uh, using JTAG runs right from your prototype stage all the way through to production. So as as a process in initial world bring up, it can be extremely useful for solving that problem. I've got my new hardware, I've got my new firmware, the board's not working, but why? Um, so you can um, have a a different means of going in and okay let me use boundary scans to mm -hmm. test the um the adc can i communicate with the adc in boundary scan using a, a uh using i squared c and i know the i squared c protocol works because it's because that's the same across all of my i squared c devices so if it doesn't work on this adc that's because there's a board issue if it does work on the adc then i've got a firmware issue mm -hmm. so yeah but absolutely and also, you don't need like any special technician to find out where actually is the problem on the board because anyone can run this software and they will just bring it to engineer and say it's I square C. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. So that there are um, fix it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, there's lots of uh, uh, things you can do um, in boundary can. So talking about faults, if I uh, run this test again I'm going to introduce a couple of faults actually on the circuit board um, and I'm just going to have the test stop um, once it hits those faults so I just run those through um, so here we've got a, a test run through and uh, it's de detected a couple of shorts on the board so when we detect the shorts uh, same as before we've got access to our schematic viewer to sort of look at the nets that are shorted together uh, but also, um, as part of a setup, I can also include the layout for the circuit board. Mm -hmm. so this is the uh, physical layout of the circuit board. And I know where is the short. It's on the connector. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, but uh, if this was a real short... Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I'm just yeah. kidding. Um, the, the idea would be that... I understand, okay, I understand. Yeah, yeah. Looking at these nets here, where can that short be? Okay, I've got a QFP mm -hmm. here um, with the, the two adjacent pins, highly likely is where my short is or, yeah, or over on my connector. So going through, um, and then you can do fun things with this as well. So you can sort of put the, take a picture of the circuit board and overlay it so you could figure out where I've got wow. access to, a, where, where I've got <laughs> access to a, a via to help me as a technician, understand what well, okay, I need to go probe these nets. This is cool. So uh, these are like uh, Gerber data and, uh, and uh, it's uh, not pictures, Gerber or? data. And what it's is it? ODB. It's ODB plus. Ah, plus. ODB. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, absolutely. So um, Gerber data. ODB. Have... It, it has more information, so they will exactly. exactly know what net it is and. Exactly that. Yeah. Exactly that reason. So to be able to. To be able to reference the net, you need to know where it is, and ODB has that information where Gerber doesn't have that relationship between the net and the net name. This okay. I really like this uh, over uh, uh, what is it overlay or what is it overlay? Yeah, yeah, yeah with so. with the real picture, I, I really like yeah. it. So so yeah, you can bring up the uh, uh, sort of that to help debug a circuit board. So for you. For your fault cases, yes, you've got simple capability to where a your technician on a production line mm -hmm. can get to root cause of the failure without having to go to mm -hmm. the engineer every time yeah. to say, 
what this failure is. I, I can uh, see the benefits now. Uh, I, yeah. you know, before we had this call, I was a little bit wondering, like, why uh, or where would be the advantage of uh, JTAG testing and the functional testing. And now I'm trying, I'm starting to seeing these differences because you need less uh, technical skills uh, people to actually fix for example problems or uh, you yeah. know find out where the problems are and uh, many people they can have a look like oh, okay the problem should be somewhere here so they will have a closer look and they see oh, okay there is short circuit or something yeah exactly so we know how this can be useful now let's see how difficult it is to create this test yeah sure um This is clearly this one. So, so this is the uh, development environment, and what I'm going to do is open up the completed test system, uh, and then we'll just talk through what the process is to create it. Is that okay? Okay, I'm curious. Um, so, here I'm just opening up the the project for the board there. So to set up a, a board, um, the development environment here has a, a set of screens that you can run through where you either enter information or answer questions about the circuit board to enable the system to understand what it can do as far as testing the circuit board is concerned. Okay. So the first screen that we start off is the board screen. And this is where we enter the raw information about the circuit board that we want to test, or the circuit boards, OK? So it could be testing at system level, or you could have multiple boards that plug together uh, that you want to test as a whole, OK? So you, for each board you want to test, um, you, have, you need to pull in a netlist. Mm -hmm. um, and that can be ODB++ if you want layout. Um, but it can be also any ASCII-based netlist uh, as well, okay, which loses you the capability to see the layout, but may be available earlier in your development cycle, um, which is a, a, a point we'll discuss when we look at test coverage. Um, so, and then we also uh, take in BOM information. So uh, any kind of uh, either a spreadsheet, CSV, or a text file uh, that we can import and we can pull out the, the data no fixed format for that data. We allow you to say, uh, this column of my data is my uh, manufacturer's part number. This column of my data is the value. This column is a description. This column is a footprint. Okay. Uh, and How then we do also you use this data? Is it only to well, make it easy to identify where the problem is, or you also use it to find out what kind of components uh, are uh, in, so on actually, the board? Actually, the BOM data is mainly used at this level where we are um, categorizing the components. So mm -hmm. the component values for resistors will be analyzed as part of suggesting as how, they are, how they've been used in the circuit. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, if components are omitted, uh, omitted from the bomb, you can set the system up to suggest that they're not placed, and therefore it will make those kinds of suggestions in the design. Mm -hmm. For ICs, it will look at the manufacturer's part number and then um, suggest models from the library based on those part numbers mm -hmm. where we've got a correct match. So, so that's where the bomb information is used. Um, we, we've also got pull in the schematic. So um, the, we were shown the schematic in the runtime system there, but the schematic also becomes very useful in the development stage when it's asking you to categorize a component. You can open up the schematic and see exactly how the, the component's been used in the design and either verify the, verify the suggestion the tools have made or come up or, or sort of overriding and, and tell the tools you want to treat that uh, device in a different way. Okay. So that's our, our raw data for our board. Um, if we're going to do a multi-board setup, we enter the, the raw data for all, of our, for all the boards that we want to have plugged together as a system. Uh, in that situation, if we had multiple boards, we'd go to the connection screen and that would allow the system to understand how the boards are connected together. Um, and then the system will test through those connections. Mm -hmm. okay. um, 
There, then uh, we have a power and ground net screen. So the idea here... This is almost um, like setting up simulations. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's going to be uh, very similar because we want to know a lot of the same data. So yeah, so the um, for a circuit board, one of the things we're testing is pull up and pull down resistors. Um, so to know which resistors are pulled up, which resistors or which nets are pulled up, which nets are pulled down, we need to know where the power and ground nets are. We also want to be in a situation where if you um, are have a, a pin on a boundary scan device which you can control that is directly connected to power or ground that's tied, we want to know about that so we don't have a drive against that power rail. So this is interesting. Uh, so does it mean that based on your schematic, uh, some of this test is going to be automatically generated? Yeah, so, so you don't uh, have to write everything from scratch, yeah? Oh, so so the test that's not that's going to be automatically generated is that connectivity test that mm -hmm. one we ran at the beginning, the, the, and that test would typically get you the majority, eighty ninety percent plus of the shorts and stuck at coverage for your service. Wow. I so, didn't know this can be done automatically. Yeah, so that's that's the idea. That's why the system wants to understand the circuit board it's testing, so it can create can generate that test automatically. Okay, um, and then for the other components on the circuit board, the non JTAG devices, what we're looking to do um, in most cases with those, the connection test would have automatically tested for shorts and stuck outs. Those tests are primarily focused on improving opens coverage. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so that, that's the aim of the power and ground nets here is it allows the system to start building up a uh, an understanding of how, how the components on the circuit board are connected. Okay. Um, the, uh, after you've done the power and ground nets, uh, we go on to the JTAG chain screen. Mm -hmm. So this is where we are looking to bring in those BSDL files for the devices so that we can you know how to control the devices when we want to operate. But what this, once you've done this, what that gives us is we've got the net list. We know from the BSDL files what, or we, which are the JTAG devices. We know which there for which nets on the circuit board we can control. Um, and therefore, we can start building up a test model for that circuit board based on the components or on those nets. Okay. Wow. So, you know, I'm, I'm starting uh, having this feeling like this is like super expensive software <laughs> because it's really cool. <laughs> um, uh, it's um, uh, it, for what it does. Um, most people are using it, find it gives you cost saving very quickly um, on the savings of the time for not failing boards, um, those kinds of things that, that it very quickly uh, pays for itself. Um, I had a one customer uh, I've dealt with recently who fixed two boards um, and had paid for the, the investment in the software by the time they got through through that. But, uh, Especially for expensive boards, I can exactly. imagine. Yeah, this. absolutely. And, and that's before you get into the engineering time that would have been uh, Exactly. Spent. Yeah, It's not only uh, the cost of the board, which yeah, otherwise a, would be wasted, but it's also the time of the engineer, like yeah. senior engineer probably, which yeah. would have to find what the problem is and then fix it. Yes, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Lots of anecdotal stories of, of people spending two, three weeks trying to debug a, a failure on a board, and then they and then find they, out oscillator is not oscillating. Yeah, and yeah, uh, actually, <laughs> they spend half an hour with me, and I've isolated the, the isolated the fault for them. Um, and yeah, and the, yeah, the, that's where the tools will pay for themselves very quickly. So when I touch this topic, uh, can you say something about the price, or uh, people would need to contact your company? Um, so, uh, as a um, uh, as a general thing, a pro a, a, what we're looking at here is professional level uh, boundary scan tools. So, generally, a, a runtime environment is going to cost you somewhere in a region of about uh, ten thousand mm -hmm. dollars US, uh, and then a development environment um, will cost you in 
twenty thousand dollars plus mm -hmm. for a, a, a development environment. Um, and you need both, yeah, because you need uh, or basically uh sometimes they can ask you to the exactly that mm -hmm, so yeah so you send them all the files and they just use the uh, exactly it, okay it depends on on, on uh, your uh, situation uh of uh how many boards you're developing what your skill set is um your engineering time mm -hmm. again one of the cost savings is is not spending the time developing the test but it can be not not spending the time developing the test so let's outsource all of that to 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 the experts and have them develop the test for us um a, a general model that works with lots of customers very well is um a, they have a development system they get us to do a, a a board at some point in its life cycle and then they manage that so as that board evolves over time and over its life cycle they update the test that we initially developed so mm -hmm. they get best of both worlds they get um uh, sort of all of the tests uh, the, the maximum use of the system uh, without having to invest lots of engineering time mm -hmm. to, to so keep you, you make the there. structure and they will just adjust what they exactly need. yeah absolutely mm -hmm. and then we've got other customers who uh, maybe a, a test engineer working in a test environment where their, their only job is to test circuit boards will be a, a full full user of the tools mm -hmm. and won't, won't use us at all because that's their role so they're experts. They are also experts on the system, uh, and can bring up and do full development themselves. So it depends mm -hmm. where uh, where you want to be, what fits within your business, uh, within your business model for development, for time, uh, and those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's we can continue in this. In this uh, boundary scan picture, what what is the R fourteen? Oh, that's a resistor. So. In our um, in our um, schema, yeah, ah. in our recommendation for your JTAG connectivity, we said about having a series I termination remember. on video. Okay. So, so what we're doing here on this screen when we're pulling in the BSDL files, as part of doing those preliminary checks, so I was saying, as so you're pulling in your uh, design in your early stages, you've just done schematic capture. So what the system does, apart from pulling the BSDL files and associate those with the JTAG device, it actually also checks that have I connected my mm -hmm. JTAG mm -hmm. uh, chain correctly? Do I have TDI running through the device connected to the right pin? Is my TMS and my uh, T-clock connected to the board correctly? Um, and it will even check that you've got the correct terminations mm -hmm. on the board so the JTAG chain will work correctly and it will stay in, inactive when you're not using it. So it, it, the, the intention is, well, so, so our tools won't work if your JTAG chain doesn't work. So mm -hmm. we, we tools will, if you, if you give them the information early in the design cycle, try and check that your JTAG chain has the right level of connectivity to at least stand a chance of working. I would expect you to, to see in this chain. Uh, so uh, the other JTAG device, so there are two JTEC connectors. Yeah. So I've got two. Uh, so the the on the um, uh, JTEC chain on the circuit board is split out into two separate JTEC chains. Okay. Um, so on that twenty-way header, yeah, we've got two independent JTEC chains. Mm -hmm. Then all understand. the extra signals as well. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so we can see see that as well. Um, yeah. So you, you can have multiple JTEC devices per chain. It just happens on this board that we've only got. Those. The two devices we've got two separate JTAG chains for them. Okay, so what is next on in this so, menu? So after we've done the JTAG chain, after that we go on to categorize the non JTAG devices on the circuit board. And what the system is interested in, it's not interested in all of the components on the circuit board, it's interested in the circuit uh, the components that are connected to the nets that um, we have JTAG control over because they're the ones we can test. So it's not going to ask you to categorize the feedback resistor in your power supply because boundary scan can't yeah, test that. Um, so what would happen is you'd come onto this screen and this list of uncategorized devices would have various different suggestions in it. Everything from C resistors and pull resistors up to LEDs and actual ICs that we want to interact with and, and, uh, and test. And the, the, the process of uh, 
testing the circuit uh, or developing the model for testing the circuit board is to move those devices from the uncategorized devices list into uh, one of our assignment categories. Mm -hmm. So we've got some uh, test devices. Uh, so everything from our LEDs to our SRAMs and flashes. Mm -hmm. uh, so these are associated with a test script uh, where uh, we can say how we want the system to interact with that device on a bus level. Mm -hmm. We define some bus level transactions with that device, and then we can set up um, routines that call those bus level interactions to perform tests on the device. Okay. Um, we can have logic devices. So these are buffers, AND gates, OR gates, all those kinds of things. Something I can, can describe with a truth table that doesn't hold state. So uh, you can't do flip flops because um, they're effectively memory devices, but anything short of that, MUXs, all your sort of many of your standard 74 series logic devices can be described with a simple truth table and therefore the system can then interact with those devices automatically as either part of that connectivity test at the beginning. So if I've got a JTAG device, then a logic device connecting to another JTAG device. We can, yeah, I we was can exactly thinking uh, how it is done. So you have the microcontroller, for example, then you have the gate and then you have different uh, microcontroller, then you can toggle the inputs of the end gate and see the output on the other device. Exactly that. Okay. Yeah. So uh, here's the simple example. So if we just go and jump to this in the schematic, we've got uh, a little inverter here. Uh, so an in so we've got an inverter going into a, 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 null, a, a null gate. Um, so we've got the, the, these signals, we've got access from different JTAG devices on the various mm -hmm. different signals. So we can set this. We know that this should then be the inversion of that. And then we can set A16. Wow. So no decode should be. And then we can check all the way through that truth table automatically. <laughs> Who creates? Uh, you need to create the models for these components. No, so uh, as you can see here, so we have library models for most mm -hmm. uh, 74 series logic devices. So these are your own uh, libraries or customers, yeah, so they would need to create their own or? No, 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 no. So uh, the, the way it works is the libraries are built into the tool. So when you, as part of the application, um, the libraries, you get the libraries. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so the, the logic library is installed in the tools and then the test device library is installed in the tools mm -hmm. as well. So with the developer environment, uh, that's part of the package is is our, our library models. Uh, nice, as well. that's very nice. Um, and as we'll see in a in a minute, um, you get the source code of the library models as well, which then means that if you do want to adjust the way the tests mm -hmm. work uh, for a particular uh, characteristic, you can change that. Uh, and then the 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 last. Um, sort of significant category is the passive device category. So in here, we're talking about pull resistors and series, generally devices that make connections between nets in some way. So resistors, series resistors, they affect the um, sorry, series resistor packs that joining two nets together uh, within the net list. So that extends our coverage through the net list. And then we mm -hmm. have pull resistors, mm -hmm. which effectively give a net a default value. So when we're running tests, we can, if we're not driving that net, we can expect that net to be a particular value. Okay, so that, that's the idea of uh, the passive devices. Um, the last two categories, unfitted devices. So they're the devices. Some uh, in lots of designs these days, people fit lots of options into the schematic, mm -hmm. but they don't add those when they uh, build the boards. So that's what that category is for. And then ignore devices. There'll be some devices on nets that you can access um, and you will test with the connection test. So you'll set the pins on those devices high and low. But you can't get any feedback from them mm -hmm. to prove that they're there. Mm -hmm. so most typical things, if, if you have a connector mm -hmm. and, it's not uh, and you, yeah, it's not connected. Uh, if, if, if there's nothing plugged into the mm -hmm. connector to give any feedback, uh, capacitors on nets, uh, digital nets, um, ESD diodes, those kinds of things. There's no way in boundary scan to test the presence of an ESD diode. You can set the net high, you can set it low, whether the ESD diodes there or not makes no difference. 
So with this, uh, when you mention these unfitted devices, uh, how does it work if you have different variants of your board? For example, uh, I don't know, on one board, on one variant, you have something fitted, on the other one not fitted. Do you need two different tests? Um, it depends on the device and how you want to set that up. And I square C temperature sensor. <laughs> so so um, if it was a, an I square C temperature sensor, then what you would do is you could have uh, I didn't talk about them earlier, uh, but in the test list, um, you can set a condition on a test. Um, so I, I said about earlier when we ran the LED test, if if the all LED test mm -hmm. passed, the then we would uh, skip the individual LED test. We can do the same thing for a for your I squared C temperature sensor. Mm -hmm. So when you enter your serial number at the beginning of the test, you could have system interpret that serial number to know okay that this is a uh, variant a of this board and mm -hmm. therefore the temperature sensor is going to be fitted mm -hmm. when i get down to the temperature sensor test i can set a condition here to say if it's variant a of the board run this test mm -hmm. if it's not skip it nice carry on. nice okay. so um, basically you can have one test which will cover all the variants it, it depends there are caveats on that as to what you can and can't cope with mm -hmm. and there are certain situations where um, it gets to the level where actually having multiple projects rather than having lots and lots of different conditions on lots of different tests, it becomes easier to manage multiple uh, projects mm -hmm. than it does to try and cram everything into one project. We're just going to look at the, um, the, the script files. Uh, we'll start ah, okay. off with the, script, the, the simple case. Okay. Uh, we'll look at a, Let's an see. LED. What is inside? Uh, uh, an LED. So I'm just going to jump off to this um, LED code uh, and open up. So I've gone from the categorized devices screen down to the test device file screen. So this is the screen where I can see the, the source code for the, the different um, files here. So I'll open up the test code for um, the LED. Um, uh, so a device file has um, two two levels to it. Um, uh, so one of the things we define in the device file is um, the pins on the device that we want to interact with. Uh, and we give those uh, useful names. So we can, when we're coding, we don't have to code all the pin numbers, we can just refer to an alias effectively. So that's the, the buses definition. Uh, and for this simple LED, um, in this case, uh, I want to interact with pin two, and I'm going to give that pin the name on off. Okay. I don't understand. <laughs> uh, Why so, there are two pins? Uh, so, so the LED has two pins. Yes. Pin one and pin two. Uh, ah, and okay. So all we've done okay, I understand. Is pin two. And pain. the other one, we just ignore it. Yeah. So, okay. so the other one in this instance. So, if we look in the schematic at, at our LEDs here. And what if the LED, uh, LED, LED, LED is a good component because it has to be connected? Oh, it can be connected also the other way. It can be. So so that's where you'll notice. So in this instance, um, we've got access to pin 2. Yeah. Uh, and our device file is called LED pin 2. Ah, OK. Uh, but our test code that's actually running is in a separate file called LED test. So if uh, we had a, the LED connected around the other way so that we had access to pin one rather than mm -hmm. pin two. Um, I can actually just change the very top level file that describes the bus access mm -hmm. and the LED test file here stays exactly the same. Because mm -hmm. this, this file here doesn't reference a pin number. It, it references to the on off alias. Exactly. Okay. So so then we have then we have test device files where we have multiple layers. So this simple LED has to have two layers. Uh, the push button doesn't have any layers. Mm -hmm. But our I squared C prom has sort of multiple layers. And then when we get up to something com more complicated like a DDR4, we've got lots of code files which are generic, but we can reuse in multiple for multiple tests across multiple devices. And that's only our top level file becomes specific to the device in our circuit that we want to to interact with okay so our led test our 
on-off bus, to be able to control that on-off bus, we have a language. And in our language, we have a keyword called set. Uh, as we say set on-off, uh, colon equal to a, 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 a value. So if we set this, this variable here to be a zero, it will set the pin low. If we set the um, state here to be a one, it will set the pin high. Okay. So what the system does is we're saying we've got this file associated with all these different devices, uh, D1 to D8. When we run the test on D1, the system goes, okay, you're telling me to interact with pin two on D1. You get to pin one on D2, I'll go backwards through the netlist till I find the JTAG device. And then I'll go from that JTAG device back to the BSDL file. And then I'll use the BSDL file to figure out which bits. Wow. Went <laughs> Imagine you, you would have to do it like manually. <laughs> exactly. So, so that, that's where the tools, that's what the tools are doing for you. They're separating out the complication of figuring out what all that scan is to just go, I want to set pin two on this LED high, or I want to set And you don't two. really need to like find out which uh, bit or register to set in boundary scan. Exactly. Because... exactly. You don't even have to tell it which boundary scan device you want to use to set that pin. It will figure that out. Nice. And if, there, if, if a device happens to have multiple uh, points of access, it will choose the most suitable one for you. Going back to uh, the conversation about different pins in different JTAG devices will have different capabilities. Um, so that's why we have our BSDL file. Some some pins will have three cells, some pins will have two. So there can be situations where um, certain pins in certain devices are better to use mm -hmm. because of the impact that has mm -hmm. on other pins inside that device. And you don't have to worry about any of that because the tools will figure that out mm -hmm. from that raw data that we've given from the netlist and the BSCL files for the board. Okay. Wow. Okay. So can we go back oh, to the, yeah, okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So the idea here is we have this set statement that allows us to set the state of a bus. Uh, and we can either set it we can set the pins or the bits in that bus either high, low, or we can tri state them by setting them to the value of I. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that allows us to I is three uh, three state. I would yeah, exactly, I, I yeah. saw it's, so I, its input. <laughs> yep, exactly. Input. Yeah, try state. So, so we have uh, so we've wrapped this set statement here up in a, a function which we've called set LED, and it takes in the variable state, uh, and that variable then it gets applied to the bus when it goes through that. So here is actually the test function for our LED. Um, so. Um, this is what we're calling from the test list inside XJ Runner. We uh, that's the name of the to, function. Yeah, exactly. So if, when I, if I go to the test list here, where we see our LED test, it's saying call the test function that's in the file associated with D1. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now for all of D1 to D8, it's all going to the same file and the same function. And as we call each one of those independently it does a different calculation of, okay, which JTAG boundary scan cell do I need to use to run this particular test. Mm -hmm. okay. And the format of this file, it's your own uh, format? It is, our own, it is our own programming language. Okay. We call it XJEs, um, but it's, uh, it's a sort of halfway between basic and C and lots of, uh, or uh, very common with lots of bits in VHDL as mm, well. That's what I see here, yeah. But the actual test is in this, this um, this loop here, this do loop here, do while loop, where we're simply uh, we start off with state uh, being zero. Uh, we invert the state of state to, to make it a one. Uh, we call that function we've got above, uh, passing in a one. Uh, turns the LED uh, on. Go to sleep for a bit. Uh, we check to see if there's been a response in the keyboard to say whether the LED is flashing or not. If we don't see a response, we go around the loop again, um, and then we change state from a one back to a zero, pass it in, the LED goes off, and we keep going around that loop uh, again and again and again. I understand. Now, nice. It, this is, yeah. It's not so difficult. 
No, not no. Yeah, the, it's the idea of the language is it, it's uh, the, the the concept of the language is 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 not difficult. The, yeah, of course, I would not be able to write this, but I would be able to modify it. it, it exactly. Uh, um, so, and, and that's for seeing it for the first time. Once you get used to using the language, um, it, you can start writing it. But again, you've got access to the source code mm -hmm. of the library, so um, you can see some examples. Exactly. Copy paste still uh, any code you can you can and in many cases what you want to do to test the device is uh, is very similar so it might be that your uh, I squared C real time clock is different from one in the library but the process you're going to go through to test that real time clock is going to be mm -hmm. the same you're going it to may have different ID or something and different ID it might have different configuration registers and different settings at different addresses but what you're going to want to do is you want to get it to respond to its ID. You want to set up the registers if you need to, to get the clock to run. You then want to uh, read the seconds register. You want to wait a bit and then check the second register to see if it's incrementing. Uh, so it doesn't matter what real time, time clock you're testing, that's going to be the same process. So you go and take the structure of that code and then go and adjust the initialization section to write different registers and, and then you adjust the test section to read a different register to get the seconds seconds uh, counter um uh, but yeah the the idea the concept of testing that is is very similar i think so let's have a look at the ddr4 example because that's probably the most complex one here uh it's the how different one. it is so it's it's not that different so again we start at the top level we've got our buses defined mm -hmm. so we've got the pins on the device we want to test um, defined and broken down into different buses. So there's the command bus, the data bus, the sort of control buses, uh, all those uh, various different uh, pins that you find on a, a DDR4. And then inside um, the DDR4 code, eventually, once we get down to the bottom of the code here, uh, we have uh, some cycles where we're interacting with those buses. And so this is the bus transaction level. So to be able to write this code, I'd have to understand what do I have to do to the control pins, the address yeah. pins of a you DDR4. You need to understand the protocol. It, it, the, yeah, so I have to understand enough of that. But once, ultimately what I get to is a function in this one here, mm -hmm. it's called right, write okay, first, I see. Uh, where I pass in an address and a data mm -hmm for each of the um, uh, uh, sequences in that burst write. And then once I've got that write to work, I can then just call that write burst in a test sequence. Mm -hmm. um, then ultimately, to test that uh, sequence, it's the, the concept for testing a DDR4, uh, the sort of number of reads and writes you have to do to it, and the way that you want to test it, is actually the same as it is for an SD RAM. So SD RAM, DDR, DDR2, DDR3, DDR4, the the base algorithm for testing those devices is all the same. It's it's using the special patterns, I guess, and writing them. Yes, exactly. Um, uh, and the yeah, so exactly. So those pattern the not the number of patterns you have to generate, but the the, the sequence that you want to go through. Mm -hmm. Is, is the same for all those different mm -hmm. types of memory. Mm -hmm. um, and all you have to do for different sizes of memory is write more patterns to different mm -hmm. locations. So so that's what the tools, the, the code does. It so goes that's up, the uh, third file, memtest sdram. Yeah, so memtest sdram uh, takes in the size of the address bus or the data bus for the device and then figures out how many patterns have to be written mm -hmm. for that device. It will then cycle through a, a sequence of writing those patterns into the memory and then cycles through reading them back out. Um, and then uh, uh, it then does the comparison between what was written in and what was read out and then analyzes that data to check that it's got back what it wrote in. If it doesn't get back what it wrote in, it will then generate some more patterns to try and isolate exactly mm -hmm. what it is. So it starts off assuming the board is going to work. So it runs the least number of uh, reads and writes it has to to be able to prove that the device is working it will then 
if that fails, it then goes on to extend the test mm -hmm. to um, find out which uh, data which lines in, or address lines yeah, are, mm -hmm. it, it is at, uh, is at fault. Absolutely. Wow. So it doesn't. It it will not only say that the connection to memory is uh, not working properly. It will actually say where exactly the short circuit or wrong connection it, may be. Uh, it, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, it does depend on the failure, but yes. Certainly. What else you have in this menu? What we could talk about? Okay, so the next thing I was going to talk about is test coverage. So this is uh, the test coverage report, and this is where you could get into again if you're focusing on boundary scan tests as being one of your test methodologies you're going to use as as part of your development cycle for your circuit board. You can get into the test coverage report before you've even committed to layout of your circuit board, um, and then then get to the stage where you can identify what what pins on which devices are tested for what kind of faults, um, and get to the stage where you can see which pins on the circuit aren't tested, mm -hmm. and therefore where you might want to implement other test mechanisms. Maybe you're going to go to functional tests. Maybe you're going to use some ICT or a flying probe. To, to bolster that overall test coverage, okay, or or maybe it's an acceptable risk based on your previous experience with using those components, okay. Okay, what else you have here? Um, so yeah, also built into the um, uh, the development environment is the um, all the. <laughs> I'm curious about this one. <laughs> yes, so this is um, the run and deploy section is where we set up the firstly the uh, xj link uh, to be able to interact with the circuit board so this is where we've got um the the interface of the xj link is configurable so we've got our pins and we can set different pins up as being different yeah, things that's so, what we were talking about yeah so there we've is got the I uh, C, I see. yeah we've got our jtag for our cpld we've got our jtag for our microcontroller then we've got the i squared c interface um We've got access to the reset, the oscillator pin, that's where we measured the frequency earlier, the pop here. So these are the soft frequency. grounds. If you don't yeah. use them, then you change them to be low, but otherwise you it, can assign the... It, yeah, exactly that. So I can I can change any pin to be mm -hmm. sort of any okay. JTAG signal uh, or a program or I.O. pin, and then I can use it as part of being a... Um, but I was expecting in pin mapping to see the microcontroller, for example, and see all the pins. Do you have? S uh, no, so the so that's the analyzer. Ah, okay. So, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, so pin mapping allows us to configure the extra. It's unit. for the JTAG. Yeah, for the JTAG controller, the analyzer window here. This is a graphical interface to interact with our JTAG devices. Screen. What you can do is it is a standalone tool. As, as a separate device. And it only needs the BSDL files to um, it only needs the BSDL files to be able to interact with the JTAG mm -hmm. devices, which then gives you the capability to come in and do point and click control of the pins on your JTAG devices. So I can come over to a pin over here. I can simply right click on this pin and say I want to toggle this pin mm -hmm. slowly. And now it happens that pin A3 here is connected across to pin. Um, 13 on the other JTAG device. Mm -hmm. So I can see cause and effect. Um, uh, if I go here I, and I set this one to toggle slow uh, and I open back up. So when camera. you press the play button, that means you initialize the connection and you are interacting yeah, exactly with the board. That. Yep. So it's initialized the JTAG chain, reset the JTAG devices, pulled in the BSDL files and use the BSDL files to. Um, uh, set up the board here. So yeah, mm -hmm. that uh, pin I set to toggle there, mm -hmm. um, B8 happens to be connected to this LED, so I can mm -hmm. see cause and effect actually on the circuit board as well. So, so that's all, the all the black pins are power. Uh, all the black pins are linkage pins, so a lot of them will be power, uh, but they'll also be the JTAG signals. So over mm -hmm. here we've got. So the, these are the, the pins which you can control. Co exactly. So yeah. So that's the def the pins. So. Here they're called linkage pins in mm -hmm. boundary scan. So 
the ADC pins on the uh, microcontroller here are, are linkage pins. They're analog pins, so they're not going to have a digital boundary scan mm -hmm. cell attached to them. Okay. Uh, you know, we've also got the, the crystal uh, coming into yeah, this device. Yeah, I, I can see the colors now in the legend. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, we've got the legend at the top here. So, um, yeah, uh, we've got uh, high, low, and if I can remember where it is, um, we've got the pin to enable the clock. What is the cross? It shows it's driving, mm -hmm. and so the the output cell is 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 setting the value, and at the same time the input cell is then reading that value back to check that it's uh, it's occurring, and then we can also see it's going over the other side as well. Now the main question would be like, uh, why people should go? this like some kind of more complicated way because it's a lot of time to actually create this kind of test it will cost you extra money comparing to write the more simple functional test which will for example go through the peripherals and it will tell it works or it doesn't or it reads this temperature you know when you have microcontroller or processor theoretically you can do it but First, before we start, I would like to say that uh, my feeling from what we were just talking about is, as I already said, I see huge potential in finding the problems. Yeah, so um, the, the reason to, for, for uh, boundary scan testing, uh, as we spoke about earlier, is because the other test methodologies that you would used to have used on a production line um, have uh, were the test coverage they could achieve was beginning to re or was reducing and therefore um, if you don't use boundary scan you end up with a situation of, of diminished test coverage on the circuit board um, as you say functional test is pretty good at um, saying a board works or a board doesn't work what functional test is not very good at, or it's very difficult to achieve with a functional test, is identifying what is broken so I can repair or uh, fix that circuit board so I can ship it. Um, uh, a lot of people I deal with ha have, where they're based purely on functional test, have a bone pile of circuit boards that they cannot fix because the functional test says they do not work and they, they cannot get to a situation of, okay, what doesn't work? And uh, that's everything for today's video. That's what I always do. And that's everything for today's video. <laughs> you know, because it's easy. Uh, I don't have to come up every time with something different. Uh, this time it was uh, quite difficult to actually create this video, especially because uh, there was a lot of really good material which I had to cut out. And, uh, and I really like it. I really liked creating this video. Uh, what do you think about the content of the video? Did you find it interesting? Did you find it useful? Did you learn something new? leave comments okay i would like to know also i would like to say thank you very much to david uh, for helping me to create this video so thank you david and uh, i would like to thank you very much to you because it's like two hours video so if you are still watching then wow thank you for this and now, what you already know, uh, if you like this video, don't forget to press the like button. If you would like to see my future videos, don't forget to subscribe and see you next time. Bye.